In this part of the data structure course related to object classes, we will cover template classes and template functions. Furthermore, you will learn C++ operations on arrays. Templates. We may want to use the same class or function definition for different types of items. That is, we may want to create different objects within the same class but whose data types are different. Or we may want to define a general function that works on different data types. It would be nice if we could define the data type with the object or with the function cause. For example, constr stack, this is the class name and we are trying to object A of stack type and here we are designing the data type to be floating values to be stored in the stack. And another stack object B for which the data to be stored is type character. And also we may define sequential list C where data is integer type. And here D is again sequential list, but data is character type. C++ allows this through the usage of templates. For the template definition, first we are writing template. This is a resort word. And then we inform what are the template types, for example, class T1, class T2, class Tn, etc. We, we indicate different class types here. This declaration indicates that T1, T2 up to Tn are classes that will be used with a specific class upon creation of an object. For example, constr sequential search, we are trying to search a key value of type T in a list, again, inside some items of T are stored. And here N is the size of this list. This T may be character or it may be integer, whatever we want to search for. Because of that, we first say that template class T, not here that any operation in the template class or function must be defined for any possible data types in the template. So we are writing the code for the template class T, whatever the type in the call of the sequential search, then the corresponding type will be used for the list and also for the key. It may be character or integer, whatever it is. T is a type that will be specified when sequential search is called. In the code, in the function, we have a for loop that is for integer i starting from zero. It will repeat while i is less than n and in each turn the value of the i will be incremented by one. And we are comparing list i with k. If list i is equal key, in that case the value i, the location where the key is stored is returned. If in the loop we have repeated this n times and then this condition is not holding, then it will come to this line and it will return minus one. Now call sequential search with different data types. Integer array A having 10 entries, A index and M index are all integer type. 
we have another array M having hundred entries where floating numbers are to be stored. We have F key, which is set as 4.5. And then here, A index is assigned value, whatever the return value from the sequential search. On the array A, notice that this is integer with size 10, here N is 10, and we are looking for 25. In the call, here the key is 25. And notice that this is of type integer, and also A is an integer type. Because of that, here, T is corresponding to integer. Search for integer 25 in A. In the next line, we have M index, assigned value, sequential search on the array M, which is a floating number array, having 100 entries. And we are looking for F key, which was set here as 4.5. So search for float 4.5 in M. By this call, the type of T is floating number and also for the array list, floating numbers are to be stored in the array list. Now we are going to consider operations on arrays. Here is some declaration examples. Array size is a constant of integer type, and that constant has value 50. Here there is a declaration of array A, having 50 elements because array size is 50, and floating numbers are to be stored in the array A. Another declaration, X is an array having size 50 plus 10. So here 60 elements are going to be stored and these elements are of type long, long integer. These are the declaration examples and here is assignment examples. For example, we may say that the element at the i-th location of array A is to be assigned value z. This z value is going to be stored in the location i of the array. And also, we may get an item in the array X from location I, and that item is stored into variable T. So here, a long integer value is taken from the array X and stored into T. Or we may have such an assignment. This is saying that XI, assigned value XI plus one, assigned value t. This should be read from right to left. First, the item at the location i plus 1 is set to t, and then the value here at the i plus 1 location is stored into location i for the array x. So, First, this statement is executed, this part is executed, and then this part is executed. Xi is x i plus one. So it is from right to left. Here's another example. Suppose that V has value 20, an integer a, has 20 locations. Here index ranges from
from 0 to 19. In arrays, always the first location is starting with index 0 and that comes down to up to 19 if we have 20 locations. Here, the name of the array, in fact, is a pointer contains the starting address of the array. It has the same address with the entry at location 0, array 0. Here, another declaration, integer b. If we consider the array a, here we have an array having 20 entries, a0, a1, up to a19. As notice that the address of a0 is same as the value of a. a is showing the starting address of the array. Then here we have another location, integer 4b, and then comes whatever the other declarations. If we write a v is equal to zero, assign value zero. Here notice that the value of v is 20. So here the index is out of range because we have entries starting with a zero up to a19 and a20 is out of range. But in fact, that address is corresponding to the location just after entry A19. Index is out of range, but most C++ compilers don't check this. So you should be careful if you are out of the range of the array. So you should be careful for not having out of range. Here for this example, the effect is as if B is a site value zero because we don't have A20 and it's corresponding to variable B. So the effect is B a site value zero since the first location after A is reserved for B by above declaration. We may have also two dimensional arrays. For example, integer t, 3, and 4. That means that we have three rows, and for each row we have four columns. And we may assign initial values as given here, for example. This is saying that this is the first row. Here we have four elements, and they are assigned initial values, 20, 5, minus 3, and 0. So if this is the two-dimensional array, this is corresponding to T0, the first row with index 0. And here these values are stored in the first row. Then comes the second row, and these values are stored to the second row in the initialization. And here is the third row. Here in each row we have four entries. We may get the value at row two and column three, so it is corresponding to that element. This is row two and column three, starting from column zero, one, two, and column three. And here, whatever the value stored there, which is minus 6, it is stored to the variable a. Another example here, the value of the element entry at row 0 and in the fourth column. So here, this is the row 0. But because we have only four elements here, the column four, we have columns zero, one, two, three. So we don't have column four, but it will correspond to the next element. So it means that into this location, the value A 
is going to be stored. In fact, this is out of range again. And we don't have here the fourth column because of that, because it is out of range. This value is going to be stored into that location. And another example, if we say integer t, here the size is not mentioned, but in each row we have five elements, list of five element arrays. Similar to integer or float number, etc., we may declare arrays of objects. For example, we may declare room as an array having 100 entries of type rectangle. This is an array where rectangle objects are going to be stored. Constructor is called with this statement, with this declaration. Constructor is called for room 0 up to room 99. It is called 100 times. He notes that the initial values are not provided. For the rectangle, remember that we have default values when value is not provided. Then each rectangle in each entry will be created by the default values. This declaration creates an array of 100 objects. Each have different members, all initialized in this case to the default values. Note that for declaring large array objects, a constructor with default values or with no parameters is preferred. Otherwise, it would be very hard to write each element for the initial values. If the size of the array is small, for example, here, room is an array having three elements of type rectangle, we may initialize it by a call to rectangle constructor with parameters 10 and 15. Then for the entry with index 1, rectangle 5, 8. And for the next entry, we have a call to constructor rectangle with 2 and 30. This may be practical because the size is small, but if we are going to declare a rectangle room having 100 elements, then it would not be easy. This simply initializes all length and width values to the default value of zero. Notice that the name of the array is a pointer. If we are writing void f character x, this is an array. And then here is the implementation of the function f. This is equivalent to writing void f character pointer x. Here we are saying that x is an array, so this is a pointer. And also, instead of that, we may say that x is a pointer, character pointer. Again, here we have character pointer. Then colon, for example, in the main part, we have an array, character array of size 100. And then there is a call to the function f, whatever it is written as this one or that one. Here A is the name of the array, so this is a character pointer. So this type is same as the type declared for the function. Here A is a pointer to array. 